Morning, wonderful to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. I am Brian. I'm the pastor of Calvary and Grand Prairie. Um, I'm filling in for Pastor Doug this morning. So if if you've come today for the very first time and you've not yet heard Doug Rife, you definitely need to come back. But it is an honor to be with you today. Can we give one more big hand for your worship team, man? Y'all have a gifted, gifted group. I'm telling you, that that is exciting. And, and, and the reality is, uh, I, I'm at that age, I get excited and I want to lift my hands and then I realize that I'm like 47 and my shirt is very short and so I can only go half-mast praise <laughs> because there's nothing that will suck the spirit out of a room like a 47-year-old belly just hanging out there, just like the white cloud over the temple in the Old Testament. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> but man, I enjoyed the worship. It was really, really good. Um, most of you know... Um, Calvary and Temple were really sister churches in the best of ways. Uh, your, your church and your school has done so much for my family. Um, my wife, Jenny, of course, works at Temple Christian. Uh, my daughter, Aubrey, who's here today, graduated last year. My son, Vance, is, is part of Temple. Um, I'm, the, I'm the chaplain of the Temple Eagle football team, seven and one, baby, seven and one. Yeah, I'm 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 like a lower baritone this morning because if you if you missed Friday, you missed a barn burner, man. It was good, a really really good game. Again, I only celebrated at half mass, but it was fantastic. Um, I want to pose a single question to you today, and let me say from the outset, I want to be so sweet to you people today. I, I want to be short and I want to be sweet. Can I get an amen? Um, because the reality is God knows you deserve it, putting up with Doug Rife and Neil Childs every single week. I know you've endured 542 long-winded messages from the book of Acts. I know. I know that to just endure Neil's presence for more than six minutes, you deserve a crown in heaven if you can do it. That's right, sister. That's when the tambourine comes out right there, when there's truth in the building. If you're new here, just know those are my brothers, uh, my my best friends in the world. And that's why, you know, the the love language for men is abuse. We just talk bad about each other. But I want to pose a, a single question to you today. Does your life, your current life, feel more like a blessing to enjoy or a burden to endure, okay? Right here this morning, we're talking October 23rd, 2022. We're not in the past, we're not in the future. We are right here today, just right now, with like polygraph, hand on the Bible honesty. Does your life feel more like a blessing to enjoy or a burden to endure? If we were to divide the room right down the center and say, all of you who can honestly say you're in one of those amazing seasons where life is just good, you're enjoying your family and the money's not bad and and, and there aren't any big problems on the horizon, life's just good. Listen, that's a beautiful thing if you're in that season. I'm so happy for you. Praise God he gives us those seasons. And we were to say, all of you over to this side of the building and now everybody who honestly right now, you're just making it. You're hurting, you're struggling, you are are enduring, but sometimes you feel like barely. And you were to come to this side of the room. Let me just say to, to our A side, praise God you're in that season. You know that life is hills and valleys. So there'll be something for you out of this for the future. And I especially want to talk to some of you that are in a season where life seems like a burden to endure. Um, I want to speak particularly to those in the season of life where you're sort of in your career now. You've been married a while. If you have kids, they're growing up. Your routines are established, right? If, if we can equate life to like a, a rocket launch, like, and, and some of our front row here, they're, they're just, it's all engines and power and smoke, and they're about to blast off into their life. And some of you that are retiring, it's like you're coming back down from that flight. 
the ones I'm talking to are the ones that you're in your orbit. That term orbit always gets me, circles. Life is routine, and it is busy, 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 busy. Can I just say to those that are in that season, that middle season, that routine season, that orbit season, this is the season of your greatest potential. Because here's the deal. This is the season where experience meets energy. This is the season where knowledge and some resources meets power. You're old enough that you got some wisdom and you've been around the block a while, but you're young enough, you still really have the energy to do something with it. This is a powerful season of your life. But I've been a pastor for a while now, man, and, and in the ministry for 25 years, I can also tell you, it's also the season where a lot of people get divorced. It's a season where people drop out of church. It's a season where you have a midlife crisis or you have an affair. It's the season, and it, it, it's heartbreaking because our church has endured this, where people take their own life. This is a season when many become profoundly dissatisfied. Life becomes a burden to endure rather than a blessing to enjoy. I think you'll identify with some of the reasons why, and, and, and you may not be in that middle section of life, but I think you'll still relate to these. Let me give you three of them, three reasons why life can become this burden to endure. The first one is futility. This is the season where we're especially prone, uh, prone to second guess our life choices, right? I thought I'd be here by now, and I'm not getting anywhere. I thought my marriage was going to be like this. I thought having kids was going to be like this. I, I thought by now my retirement and my money would be like this. I, I had expectations, and I thought it was just appointed, and now I've been disappointed. I'm not getting anywhere. See if this word resonates with you. I'm stuck. Stuck's a tough place to be, man. I'm stuck in my job. I'm stuck in a marriage. I'm stuck in... Whatever. Futility. Here's the second thing that, that may resonate with you, and that's fatigue. <laughs> fatigue. I have a book in my library called Building a Successful Family by Dr. Jerry Pipes, and the first time I ever read this, and this is years ago that I picked up this book, but the introduction hit me hard. It's been 12 days since mom, dad, Eric, Janie, and Melissa Morgan had a meal together. No, dad's not out of town. No one's angry. They didn't plan it this way, but they figure that's just the way life is today. You see, Eric's bus leaves for high school at 7.05 a.m. Janie leaves for middle school at 7.40 a.m. Mom takes Melissa to elementary school at 8.45 a.m., then she's off to work. She works three-quarters time so she can be with the kids. In reality, the only time she's with the kids is in the van. She feels more like a taxi driver than a mom. Janie, one of the top acrobatic and, and dance, uh, jazz dancers in her troupe, has advanced dance class after school on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday till 6 p.m. with an occasional Saturday morning rehearsal thrown in. Eric's high school basketball team, off to a 2-7 and seven start, not as good as us, is practicing overtime every day after school except on days when there are games. Melissa wants to be a dancer like Janie, so she practices with a beginner group as soon as Janie's class is over. Monday night's basketball, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday's dance. Almost every Friday or Saturday night, at least one of the kids is spending the night with a friend. Saturday's lawn day, basketball day, dance day, day of whatever, the list is endless. Mom has taken a computer course on Tuesday evenings. Some of Dad's clients insist on dinner meetings. There seems to be two or three per week. Now listen, stretched, stressed, and losing touch with each other his family is easy to find. They live in your neighborhood, on your block, maybe in your house. He's tired, man. <laughs> fatigued. Let me give you a third one. Futility, fatigue, frustration. <laughs> frustration. <laughs> I, I don't know about y'all, man. I, in the last like two years, I don't, I don't know why, my traffic frustration has gone up exponentially. 
Like I turn into a rage monster in traffic that I never wanted to be. I never wanted to be that guy. And I find it like just welling up inside of me when somebody does something stupid. Frustration. You ever feel like you're that guy that's always a day late and a dollar short? You ever feel like that juggler, you know, they do the bit where they've got the bowling pins and they keep dropping one pin and then they pick it up and they drop another one? You feel like, I just can't balance all of this financially or physically or socially or maritally or whatever. I'm burdened. You may be here today, that word burdened, right? There, there's weight on me, man. It, it, it's, I wake up in the morning and, and there's burdens and I go to sleep at night and there's burdens. And what's the point of life like this? If that's you, can I just tell you, I, I don't think it's any mistake you're here today. I believe the Holy Spirit of God brought you here today. I believe Jesus loves you and he died for you and he said, come to me all you who are heavy laden and you're burdened because I want to give you rest. I want to give you three principles this morning. Rather, the word of God wants to give you some principles today to get you from burdened to blessed. If you have your Bible, turn to Psalm 127. The 127th Psalm. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of those Bibles there in the chair. It is page 485. So you can get there quickly. 485. How many of you glad you came to church today? Say amen. amen. Psalm 127, verse 1. This chapter has a lot of personal significance for me. I get emotional every time I read it. Psalm 127. If you're reading out of the ESV, you may notice that before the verse 1 begins, it says, a song of ascents of Solomon. Every chapter from 120 to 134 here in Israel's songbook starts that way, a song of ascents. We are going upward. Israel supposedly would sing these psalms when they were going up to worship at the temple, when they were getting up the walls in Nehemiah's day. These are hopeful psalms. These are how to get out of life is a burden to endure and back into life is a blessing to enjoy. So let's learn some things from this today. Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Here's that word again, and it means empty. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. I told you, I'm 47 years old, and every time I read Fruit of the Womb, I want to laugh because I'm childish. <laughs> Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, are the children's of, uh, children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. I'm going to give you a few thoughts from this passage. If you're going to go from burdened to blessed... Listen, you may not be able to change your circumstances. God doesn't always promise you a transfer. But God can transform you in the middle of your circumstances. God may not move you, but he'll move you. He'll change you. He'll help you. Principle number one, to go from burden to blessed. Embrace purpose. Embrace purpose. Purpose. Verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. They're wasting their time. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. He's wasting his time. Life becomes a burden when we feel like we're not getting anywhere. I'm not making any progress here. What I'm doing is futile. You ever feel like that? It doesn't matter. Ooh, man, moms, you're raising those kids, and, and it's way more like dirty diapers than it is delight. Way more chores than celebrations. You're working at that job, and your boss is ungrateful, and there's no seeming 
loyalty to you when you do your best or you don't try at all. Life feels futile. It doesn't matter. Listen, if God isn't in what you're doing, you're right. Life's futile. My work is futile. My time is futile. If God isn't in what you're doing, you're right. It's vanity. You're wasting your time. Your work won't last. You are wasting your life. Oh, listen. Is God in your business? Is God in your marriage? Is God in your family? Is God in your pastimes? How do you go from burdened to blessed? You put God in the thing. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Look at that. That changes things. Christopher Wren was the designer of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And years ago, he wrote about the, uh, the reaction of construction workers who were asked what they were doing working on that project. Christopher Wren, right, the architect of this gorgeous, gorgeous building, he said some guys were like leaning on their shovels, bored, lackadaisical, doing as little work as they could, and they didn't know who he was, so he said, what are you guys doing? What are you up to? And the answers were, I'm laying bricks. I'm carrying stones. Christopher Wren said there was one guy with a smile on his face, working when they were resting, moving with intent. Christopher Wren was fascinated, and he stopped them, and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a magnificent cathedral. Let me ask you a question. You just lay in bricks? Is that the point of your life? Are you doing something for the kingdom of God? Oh, friend, listen, you and I have got a purpose, and it is way bigger than we realize sometimes. You have a purpose that stars and angels can't fulfill. Only you. You have the ability to know God intimately and show God accurately to the world like nothing else in creation. You have the ability, and listen, it doesn't matter whether you're in, in a corner office building with a great view of Dallas and you're making a million dollars a year or, or you're working at a Burger King in the through line. You have the ability to know Jesus and show Jesus to people every day. Just by how you work, just by how you smile, just by how you live. Listen, God put you down here for one thing and one thing only. It is to know Jesus and to show Jesus. And friend, listen to me. If you want to see where all your attainments outside of God are going to go at the end of your life, stop by the graveyard after church. You want to see where all your stuff's going, all the cars, all the homes, all the golf clubs, all the stuff, stop by the junkyard after church. Not a bit of it will you take with you, and none of it will last. But if you got God in what you're doing, you will influence the people around you. You will pull them with you toward Jesus. Oh, listen, somebody who's frustrated in your job, listen to me. You may have been praying, God, give me a transfer, give me a transfer, give me a transfer. He might give you a transfer, he might not. But listen, Colossians 3.23, when I preach that at my church, I always tell my staff, you better not raise your hand, man. I'm like, <laughs> my boss, he's such a jerk. Colossians 3.23, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master, the boss you are serving is Jesus Christ. Wow. Doesn't that change things? That means everything matters. Everything. Let me give you a second thought. If you're going to go from burden to blessed, embrace purpose. Second of all, prioritize rest. Prioritize rest. You're like, Brian, I am. I've been doing that while you're speaking, in fact. <laughs> Verse 2. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Wow. Wow. For he, man, why does that one always get me emotional? 
he gives to his beloved sleep. Somebody wrote, we are a hassled, short-tempered, horn-blowing society, perpetually commuting between poorly planned activities that add very little to our well-being. Stop and think, when was the last time you marked off a block of time in your planner and wrote rest across the middle of it? Your pastor uh, preached a message. I love, I love hearing Doug and Neil and preach and your staff doing what they do so well. He preached a message on Elijah that I thought was so good out of 1 Kings 18. And he was talking about how, how Elijah, you know, he, he's this prophet of God, man. And he just had this showdown with the prophets of Baal and fire came down from heaven. And like Elijah thought, okay, war's over, man. Like we're good now. Like everything's, everything's in place. Like, like, Life is going to be good. And of course, Jezebel came after him with a vengeance and he was done, man. He was discouraged. He just said, God, just kill me. Just kill me. I'm not any better than my father's. I, life is futile. Life is meaningless. Life, what's the point? And you would think God would send down fire from heaven again. Get onto him. Or send some angel to like preach this message to him and encourage him. God did three things for Elijah. And your pastor's three points were this. When you are worn out in body and soul, number one, eat cake. <laughs> number two, take a nap. Number three, go to church. Whew. You think God doesn't know you're worn out? You think he doesn't care? God has an angel. He lets it. Elijah fall asleep, and when he wakes up, he has an angel bake him a, bake him a little cake. <laughs> a little cake, the Bible says. And he eats that little cake, and he goes back to sleep again. And he says, Elijah, it's been a long time, man. Come meet with me on the mountain and rest. You know, I've had a battle for years in the ministry with trying to be balanced. I don't feel like I'm balanced. I'm like, you know, like if I work on something, the other thing just falls apart, right? It's so frustrating. When you're trying to get your money in order, right? Like you're working on your finances and over here life just goes chaos on you, right? You're working, you're working on this and your family's having struggles. And all my life I've been like, why can I not be balanced? And here's the thing that I'm starting to realize. I don't want to be balanced. I want to be passionate about stuff that matters, some of that stuff, you should just let it fall because it doesn't mean much. What if we stopped trying to be balanced and we were passionate about some stuff that matters? Stephen Covey wrote a book called First Things First, great title, and he put in it a great story. You probably heard it before. One of Covey's associates had experienced this at a seminar. Um, the, the speaker gets up and he has a clear container and he has another container filled with rocks. And he takes the rocks, just everybody's in the audience is watching, he doesn't say a word. He starts putting the rocks in one at a time till the whole vessel is completely full. And he says, can, can you get anything else in this jar? And the crowd goes, no. Reaches down, he gets out another vessel full of smaller rocks. And he fills it to the top. And now they're kind of on to him. Can you get anything else in this jar? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Here's the sand. Can you get anything else in this jar? Yes. You're right. Here's the water. And now it's full. He says, what's the point of this little exercise? Somebody raises their hand and they thought they had it. And they smiled and they said, the point of this is there's always room for one more thing. And he kind of smiled to himself, and then he looked up, and he says, no. <laughs> the point is, if you're going to get the big rocks in, you got to get them in first. Can I suggest to you that your relationship with your mate is a big rock? Your relationship with those babies that aren't babies anymore, maybe, or maybe they are. Or maybe you're raising your grandkids, or maybe, can I suggest to you that's a big rock? 
Can I suggest to you, your life with a group of believers and your life with Jesus Christ is a big rock. And if you got too much sand and too much water and too much sediment of a thousand lesser things, you'll miss it. Can I ask you the question? If I can go back to rest for a minute. How long has it been since you've had a vacation? Do you take a day off? The principle of a Sabbath, one day to let my heart and my soul catch up with my body. How long has it been since you've had a date night? And said, honey, we're going out and the phones are turning off. And it's just me and you. And the kids say, can we go? And you say, no, you can't go. Be gone, consumer of my resources. Rest. You will break the bow if you keep it always bent. The Greeks used to say. Principle number one, embrace purpose. Principle number two, prioritize rest. I'm telling you, haven't you seen like you go to bed at night sometime and a problem is so heavy, you think you're going to die. And the next morning, it's like, okay, it's different. Some of you, you're not a bad person (laughs) and God hadn't forgotten about you. You're tired. You're tired. Principle number three, I tread on it a little bit. I'm prone to do that. Abandon balance. Abandon balance. Look at verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills this quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. First time you read this, you're like, why does Solomon, he's talking about building and He's talking about not getting up early and going to bed late, and then he just starts talking about kids in verse 3. It seems like he's ADD, the way he's jumping around here. But the reality is he's talking about priorities. It's vain if God's not in what you're doing. And he didn't build you to constantly run and run and run and run. You need rest. And I just wonder if one of Solomon's kids didn't run by while God was inspiring this psalm. And he remembered, you know what matters more than anything in the world? Him. Her. And he gathered that baby up in his lap and kissed their forehead and he remembered. God and people matter to God. (laughs) God's glory and people's good. Man, I don't want to miss my people. I don't want to invest my life in success and forget that all around us, every single piece, even of this beautiful auditorium, will be broken down one day, but every person in here will last for eternity. You're eternal. They're eternal. A guy asking for money on East Chase, he's eternal. That person, that, that their lifestyle horrifies you, they're eternal. C.S. Lewis said, eternal horrors are everlasting splendors. They will always be. What if we were passionate about putting first things first? I want to close with this. Um, eight years ago, I was kneeling in a hotel room in Antigua, Guatemala. Some of you have been there. And I was burdened. I would brought a group of a dozen of our people. And our church missions had been an odd thing at our church for years where it was very distant, right? It was like we sent money to people over there and we didn't really know them real well. We saw their slides once a year. 
Um, and, and, and I had a, a passion and a burden that it needed to be more. And Jenny and I had gone on a trip to Guatemala that broke me down. I met people and saw things that would literally, I'd have to walk away from the group and like go just bawl like a child. And he broke me down on that trip to the point that I thought, God, I know our church has got to be involved in this. And, and I, trying to move the chess pieces and trying to make everything work, that's a terrible habit of mine. I'm like, okay, God, this is how we're going to do this. This is how this is going to go. I'm going to bring this missionary from Dominican Republic with us, and he seems like a good dude, and I think he'll mix well with our people, and they're going to get a taste down here in Guatemala of missions, even though they haven't had so much of that before, and they're going to fall in love with this guy, and then we're going to go start a a work in Dominican Republic. And then like two days before, this guy gets sick and he can't go on the trip. So now we're in Guatemala, and I've got a dozen people that are like, so pastor, this is like an exploration trip. What are we exploring? And I'm laying there at two in the morning, just burdened with, golly, I don't don't know what to tell them. I I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't don't have any sense of anything. And then it's all the, man, am I a bad pastor? Am I not walking with God? All that self-doubt stuff creeps in. It's three in the morning. And y'all, on the Bible, (laughs) I I was like, God, I got to know what to do. And I did the old hope and poke method. Have y'all ever done that before? Oh, God, please show me what to do, right? You ever done that? Like, I know better. I know that's dangerous. I heard about a guy years ago. He got out his old King James Bible, and he's like, God, I need a word from you. Whatever you say, I'll do. And he flipped through there, and he put his finger down. It said, Judas went and hanged himself. He's like, oh, God, it can't be that. He flipped through again. He put his finger down. Go and do likewise. He's like, God, there's no way it's that. He flips through again, puts his finger down. What thou doest, do quickly, right? (laughs) It's not a great idea, but God is so good and so big and so holy. (laughs) He'll even use that for us sometimes. And I put my finger down right in the spot in the Old Testament where David had said, God, I want to build you a temple and I want it to be nice and I want it to be great and I'm going to do this for you and I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of being a warrior. I want to be a builder. I want to do something special. And Nathan the prophet's like, that's a great idea, David. Let's do it. And then God comes and talks to Nathan and God tells him, no, Nathan, I got a message for David. And David gets word, God doesn't want you to build a temple. (laughs) He wants your son to do it. He's not going to let you build him a house. But David, he's going to build you a house forever. Because in your lineage will be Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I'm telling you all, you know those moments with the Holy Spirit? I was like, it was almost like the Lord said to me, Brian, it's adorable that you want to do this for me. That's cute. But I got it well in hand. And I went to sleep. And the next day we got up and we were visiting a brand new village we'd never been to called El Arado, Guatemala. And we stood on a piece of property that Manna had just bought. And they said, we got a dream of building a feeding center and a church and a medical clinic and a vocation. We got big dreams, but there's a poor community. And I'm telling you, when we came back that night to have our devotionals, Before I could start talking, one of our ladies raised her hand. She was like, preacher, can I say something? God help us if we don't go help these people in El Dorado. We've got to do it. And the next one raised his hand. His tears are running down his eyes. She's right, pastor. We got to, man, we got to do this. And God did in a flash what I couldn't do with months of trying and effort. Do you understand he's a God of the suddenlies? He'll let you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait till you got no hope and you think it's never going to change and then suddenly he'll change things. Well, can I tell you that now there is a church building in El Arado, Guatemala. There's a pastor, there's a feeding center, there's a vocational clinic, there's a medical clinic, and people are accepting Christ left and right because God's bigger than us. (laughs) 
And what I didn't tell you is right on the heels of the hope and poke method. God brought to my heart, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I sent a picture. Did that, I don't know if that picture made it. It's up here. One of our young ladies climbed a ladder of the brand new church in El Arado, Guatemala, when we were painting it. And when we didn't have a pastor of that church and we were begging God to send us one, we wrote that right over the spot where he was going to preach one day. Are you burdened? Has life become a burden to endure rather than a blessing to enjoy? Would you stand real quietly with me all over this place? I love your pastor. I love that week in and week out, he's doing the, the work of feeding the sheep, the work of laying ground and foundations. I get to come in here and do a one-off message on what the Holy Spirit puts on my heart. But I'm hoping this one-off message was for somebody here. Because if the truth be known, you're right on the edge of quitting. Maybe quitting your marriage. There are some biblical reasons to do that, okay? I'm not, there's no shame in here. There's no, there's some biblical reasons sometimes for that. But it may just be, you don't think you can go on anymore. Somebody ready to bail on a job or bail on a career. It might be time that God's moving you, but, but it might not. Oh, God, there may be somebody here. You're at the end of your rope, man. And the truth is, you've been thinking a lot about taking your own life. I've been there. I think there's probably a lot of us in here who've been there. Can I just tell you, you've got a father who loves you so much. He let his own son get nailed to a cross and brutalized to bring you back from the brink, to give you hope, to wipe away your sins and give you Jesus' record of lifelong obedience and give you the Holy Spirit to change you right now. Friend, listen to me. You got a point in your life. You got a purpose in your life. God may be taking you down low so he can lift you up high. Sometimes you can't get all of God you want till he's all you got. So I want to pray for us, and then I just want to take a minute for us to talk to him. If you need to come and kneel or kneel at your chair or, or just stand there, or you're watching this online and you're on your couch, the posture is unimportant, the posture of the body, but the posture of the heart is, God, I've been burdened. <laughs> And I'm asking you for the grace to fulfill my purpose. Show me where I can rest. Show me how to get the big rocks of my life in place. Father, I want to thank you that you're so good to us. That you never give up. We give up. But at those very moments, you're there. God, I want to pray for somebody. My heart is burdened for somebody here this morning that they are just on the brink. Please give them the hope of the Holy Spirit in their heart today. God, please give them just what they need to make it through, not simply to survive in life, but to shine. And God, I want to pray for that one that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And God, I pray today that 
your hand would be upon them so heavy in love that you would pursue them relentlessly until they bow the knee and say, Jesus, I'm tired of trying to be good enough to get to you. I need a savior. God, we give this time to you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. All over this place, while they play and sing, let's talk to him. Let's talk to him.